Well, why are we here and what are we doing on Friday mornings at 6.30? Um, we are trying to build more and deeper disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the, the ongoing mission, and uh, we never run out of material, <laughs> and we never run out of opportunity to, be more, to, to build more disciples and deeper disciples for Jesus. And uh, we're in a series called Stand Your Ground because we are in a battle and the battle is coming closer and closer, and we see it more clearly every single day in our culture. The, the battle against what God wants, and the battle that is tr- slowly squeezing us. And uh, I had a, a kind of a rough day yesterday, uh, just hearing from different members of our body who are embattled, uh, hearing from pastors who are embattled. Um, people are struggling with... Uh, uh, one one pastor struggling with his whole denomination that is uh, redefining. It's a conservative or has been a conservative denomination. They are struggling with a whole group of pastors who are leading a charge to redefine human sexuality, uh, to to carry on um, gay marriages and and things like that. And uh, they're wrestling with it. And they will. Uh, this sounds pessimistic. They'll probably lose their heritage uh, in this. Um, the battle is on. Uh, one of our board members, or one of our elder board members, was at a school board the other night, and they, he got notified 24 hours before it was happening. They were voting on uh, a, a policy to, uh, to declare transgender bathrooms and locker rooms in a charter school that's K through eight. His daughter's a fourth grader in this school, and he heard about it. Several people went to the board and spoke, and, and at least a partial victory, they were able to delay the vote, and they think they have a couple of board members who are hearing them. The question is, can the board do anything actually without the school being sued? There are higher powers at work here. There's stuff going on where even boards really don't have much power. That's a question. Uh, I've been contacted by numerous people who are struggling with their, the vaccination mandates. And let me just repeat, we are not an anti-vax church. We're not teaching one way or the other, but we are saying you need to have the freedom to follow your conscience and, and what you feel about, about not only your spiritual beliefs, but your own bodily autonomy. And you're free to take the vaccine if you want to do that. But if you don't want to take it, you ought to be free not to take it. So I've had no, a number of people contact me, and uh, now people are contacting me who are actually administrators who, who have to enforce the policy. And they're saying, now what, what do I do? You know, because this is going to affect a lot of people. But there are some victories here, uh, a partial victory at the school board the other night, and then I just got an email, uh, picked it up this morning from uh, a woman in our church who uh, works in a local hospital as a physical therapist, and I just want to read you this letter. This is a Daniel kind of letter, because she was granted an exemption for a, the next year, and she's very grateful. But let me just read you, I, I'm just so proud to be associated with a person who can articulate this so well. And when I think about all the letters that are going out uh, in this way, I think of the witness and the testimony that's going out with these things. So let me read this, it's a fairly lengthy letter, but let me read it to you. I have been a physical therapist for over 26 years. During that time, I have faithfully served my patients by providing optimal care both emotionally and physically. Throughout that time, I have diligently prayed for my patients as well as for myself and my family with the possible risks I have taken in serving a population that is often struggling with sorrow and sickness. My Christian beliefs have been integral to my work as a physical therapist and are the cornerstone of this accommodation request regarding my sincere religious beliefs. I'm requesting a religious exemption from the COVID-19 vaccine. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 in the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Likewise, James 1, 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to, without reproach, and, will be, and it will be given to him. Because I am a Christian, my decisions are made by seeking God's direction and discernment for my life, including the decision regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. 
I have sought the Lord's direction regarding this decision in light of my personal situation of having natural immunity from being infected with COVID-19 virus, all the available medical research to date, and the origins of all three currently available COVID-19 vaccines, having a history of development from aborted fetal cells. I cling to the belief that life in the womb is sacred and that abortion is against God's will. Repeatedly in my inner conviction, which according to my faith is God's Holy Spirit dwelling in me as I stated, do, not, do you not know that you are a te- the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? This is, my defining, this is defining my decision to not get the COVID-19 vaccine. To deny this conviction would be to deny the very voice of God who is impressing this on me. Due to my very sincere religious beliefs, I cannot do that, nor can I say anyone would have the right to make that decision for me in regards to the decision I've been parted to me by the Holy Spirit of God. I've been blessed to work here all these years, and it has been my desire to continue to be a part of this great team. I have strived to uphold the values of this hospital uh, as defined in your value statement. Quote, we value the uniqueness of each person and work to ensure everyone's right to privacy. We respect the cultures, values, beliefs, and traditions of others and honor their talents and contributions. Unquote. I would expect no less honor for myself than what I have shown to patients and to co-workers all these years. What a great statement. <laughs> Based on your uh, statement of dignity as defined by the organization itself and my sincere God-honoring religious beliefs, I am submitting this religious accommodation form which declares I have spiritual religious beliefs which are not in line with receiving the COVID-19 vaccine and I am declaring a right to an objection of conscience regarding what I put in my body and that, that this in no way should interfere with my role or rights as an employee. Sincerely. Well, what a great letter, <laughs> you know. I mean, and, and I just pray that others that are going out like that will, will have a witness, whether, whether it's granted or not. You know, this is kind of in the spirit of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, we know that God will take us through the fiery furnace, but if not, you know, the testimony is out there. So there are uh, lots of people struggling, lots of things embattled, um, but there are some victories as well. So uh, keep... Keep praying. The battle is coming. We're all going to face it someplace, sometime. And uh, it's coming close to home uh, for, for all of us. So we are building a, a biblical worldview. And uh, the reason we're doing that is so that we can stand our ground in the culture that is squeezing us like a python. And when you're building a biblical worldview, often you take on a subject that you wouldn't normally select on the buffet line, you know? <laughs> You, you wouldn't select the broccoli, you know. Uh, you might not select some kale, but you need to eat that stuff. And so we're walking through the Ten Commandments as the scaffolding of our biblical worldview. And we're on commandment number six, which comes in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, and it says, you shall not murder. Well, that's the negative side. That's the dark side. That's, this, that's a real simple side. Okay, Got that, I've got that commandment. But what about the 613 case laws that underscore all the Ten Commandments and that apply then to this commandment? So we want to take the, the, uh, the light side of it and say, if we're not to murder, the Scripture constantly says to us that we ought to uphold life. Jesus came to give us life. And the Old Testament is promising to those people life. So we're going to start today in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30 uh, with verse 19. And we're going to go until next Tuesday on this passage. <laughs> but uh, I love this passage. This is Moses giving the final charge uh, to the people of Israel. And here's what he says. He says, I declare to you today that you shall, surely, you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over in the Jordan to enter and possess I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give to them. That phrase is a choice phrase. Choose life. That's what we want to look at. So let's look at a biblical 
pro-life stance. It's very simple. It's right in your notes. Of all the priorities and treasures on earth, human life is the highest. It's greater than any political agenda. It's greater than any a green new deal it's greater than any legislative thing we could do the, the human life is of the highest value on earth because jesus came to rescue this life and make it eternal so that we can live with him forever so that's the that's the issue and so we ought to honor god by respecting his image in every person as difficult as that might be for dave to do are you awake back there? Uh, we have to honor God's image in every person. We have to value people and protect and preserve human life through all possible means. So, so why do we need to go over this again? You know, don't we know this? Well, I think the reason we need to do it is because Moses knew this, that at absolutes like thou shalt not murder have many, many, many applications for us to live out. And the second reason we need to go over this again is because we forget. And that's exactly what Moses is saying. You would think they would remember, here's the greatest leader of all time, at least at that point in, in world history. And he had literally carved the Ten Commandments in stone. You would think they would remember these things. But he said, no, you're going to forget. And so I want to tell you one more time. And... Um, so I want to look back at chapter 29 and, and just listen to these words of warning because Moses knows human nature and we know human nature. In uh, chapter 29, verse 18, it says, Beware lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord your God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. It's a warning. If we forget, we'll be choosing death. So our objective today is to say it again and talk about one life at a time. You uh, perhaps remember my, my analogy that I've told you many, several times about when I was growing up in, in Denver. We had a, an amusement park called Lakeside Park, and, and it had a place called the Fun House with ladders and stuff you could throw yourself at. And they had this big wooden platter that spun. It was about 20 feet in diameter, and it was, it was, it was a, a wooden platter that was slick. And so when the platter would stop spinning, everybody would pile on and try to stay on as long as they could. And so we'd try to, you know, spit on our shoes and hands and hang on to this platter as it spun faster and faster, and it would hurl us off, and the, the walls were curved up, so you'd, you'd slide up the wall. And we learned the secret, and you know what the secret is. Get to the middle. Stay in the center, and the centrifugal force won't throw you off. And that's what we're doing with building a big biblical worldview is finding the center on all these issues. And that's exactly what we want to do here. So in one sense, I want to say in a, in a snide kind of way, uh, I'm pro-choice. I'm pro-choice pro because I'm a proponent for choosing life. But, but don't publish that because that's, that'll be misunderstood. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Uh, we want to choose life. So let's talk about this. There's, there's two options. The first option is choosing death and destruction. I'm asking you to fill in some blanks in case you wondered what those were. And these are to take home, actually. You don't need to leave them for my education. Uh, you, they're made so you can stick them in your Bible or fold them up in your pocket. Or when your wife asks you, what are you doing in ironworks? You can whip this out and give her a lesson, you know, what we're doing. Choosing death and destruction. That's one option here. Now, no one wants to admit this, but this is actually what we do when we turn away from a biblical worldview. So the first way we do that is cheapening human life. We cheapen human life. Here's what it says in, in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 22. And the next generation, your children who rise up after you and the foreigner who comes from a far land 
will say when they see the afflictions of that land and the sicknesses with which the Lord has made it sick. The whole land burned with brimstone and salt, nothing sown and nothing growing where no plant can sprout and overthrow like that of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew with his anger and wrath. All the nations will say, why has the Lord done thus to this land? What caused the heat of this great anger? And then the people will say, it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went and served other gods. So we're going, that was uh, chapter 29, verse, starting with verse 22 of, of Deuteronomy. So we're going back to, really back to uh, the first commandment. You know, this, all the commandments start with number one, right? You shall love the Lord your God. Have no other gods before me. So cheapening human life is one of the ways that we, we come to death and destruction. Human life is cheapened when other forms of life are treated as equals. Human life is cheapened when other forms of life are treated as equals. We hear this a lot of, of equivalencies. Um, so, and, and it's a media deluge of, of confusing information. And so when, when radical environmentalists fail to factor in the value of human life versus the life of, of an owl or a snail darter or some other uh, particular species, when radical animal rights people fight for animals more than they do for people, or when medical care is rationed in some way, we are cheapening human life. Uh, PETA is uh, a group that... Uh, they, they may do some uh, good things on the margins, but their core is rotten. Uh, Ingrid Newkirk, who founded PETA, the protect, what is it, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Uh, there's another way to say that acronym, but I won't <laughs> say it now. Um, but they're basically teaching that humans are just another species and should not have superiority over anything. Ingrid Newkirk said this, humans have grown like cancer. We are the biggest blight on the face of the earth. Of the Holocaust, she said, six million people died in concentration camps, but six billion broiler chickens will die this year in slaughterhouses. <laughs> Is that really a moral equivalence? That is horrific. When... Peter discovered that they were going to use a donkey, a Palestinian donkey, for, to carry a bomb instead of a human being. They protested the cruelty to the donkey, but not to the 14-year-old boy that they're training to be a suicide bomber. She said this, I don't believe that people have the right to life. That's a supremacist perversion. A rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy. All those things are equal. This is not strange in our culture. So we cheapen life when other forms of life are viewed as equals. Okay, I'm going to step into some dangerous territory here. Because increasingly, this has invaded rich suburban America. <laughs> We spend, get ready, we spend 99 billion with a B on pets. 99 billion dollars. It's gone up 10%, by the way, in the last year uh, because of COVID. Uh, there's pets walking by our, walking their owners by our house every morning. <laughs> Again, love your pet, you know, take care of your pet. We spend $38.4 billion on food and treats, $30.2 billion on veterinary care and products. Um, the, the, 
the tragedy I see here, though, is not just that people like to have a dog or like to have a cat or a gerbil or whatever, and kids like to cuddle with them, and, and uh, my, my daughter's family has a, has a great dog, and, you know, he, he's, he's got one track mind. He wants to fetch, you know, you can't get rid of him. Uh, but um, so, so, so love your pet, but, but here's the issue. This is really undergirded by a subtle pantheism an Eastern philosophy. Where do you think sacred cows come from? They come from an Eastern religion that says that cow is more valuable than your child. And when I, when I think about, it, it troubles me when whole families are, are go into grieving for a week over the death of a pet. And I want to acknowledge the emotion, but I want to call on men here to say, you know, we, we can't give that much of our heart to an animal. Uh, here's an article that um, maybe makes this a little bit lighter, but there's a guy named Ronald, Roland Solenberg who has a, 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 a company called Talented Animals, and he farms them out to movies and, and different um, enterprises. And uh, he adores his dogs. He spends a great deal of time with them. But he hears what he says. He says, this question in this article is, what do these canine experts do? Here's what he says. Treat your dogs. Uh, they treat their dogs. Oh, what, they, what don't they do? Okay, there we go. What don't these canine experts do? They don't treat their dogs like humans. They don't dress them in adorable outfits every day. They don't give them ice cream for dessert on a regular basis. They don't expect their pooches to be entertained by the television when they're left at home alone. He says, seeing your dog as a little furry human isn't wrong necessarily. I think it is. But he says, it's a failure to accurately see them as what they are and who they are. Many people love their dogs make them, who make the mistake of expecting them to enjoy the same things people do. Even worse, well-meaning pet owners often expect a dog to behave as a person would in certain circumstances. This is not only unkind and unfair to the animal, it can also be downright dangerous. He talks about the fact that one of the most uh, insidious things is that people who see their pets as human babies tend to have obese pets. I just have to tell you, that's one of the most obscene things for me is to see not only the cruelty to the dog because he's 20 pounds overweight or whatever, but the fact that there are people starving in the world and we, we don't have the discipline to take care of our pets in the proper way. And the dog, can't, the dog can't run anymore. They think dogs should eat as frequently as humans despite the fact that canids have evolu evolved differently, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not wanting to go on a rant here. I'm just wanting to help us ask a question. Isn't it easy to see things creep in when we start calling our pet a family member? And there's a subtlety there that's not so subtle, that other forms of life are treated equally with human life. And we need to model for our children and grandchildren, this is a wonderful pet, we love this pet, but this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a gerbil, and they will die. They're, why do they call them dog ears? <laughs> because they add up more, more quickly. Well, let me get off that because this is on video and I may be attacked from afar. But, but, but I, but I want to get at a theological issue here because it's the subtle pantheism that raises something else to the level of human life. And we ought not allow that to happen. The second way we we cheapen or that we that we have death and destruction is neglecting human life these are numbers that will break your heart we have 153 million orphans in the world little boys and girls who never had a mommy to patiently teach them how to tie a shoe they they never got the extra blanket put over them and snuggled them into their bed at night um, no father or mother to teach them how to deal with a bully 
or to give them away in life. It's so sad. In the United States, we have 670,000 foster care kids. And what is it that we believe? We believe there's an inborn worth to every child. And so if anything should take us to fasting and prayer, it's thinking about the sad plight of these children. So neglecting human life is a, is a way that we, we bring on death and destruction. And that's happening not only in this nation, but in other nations as well. And so the positive side of that is we, we have so many families in our church and around us who are adopting children in, the, in everyday heroics. And uh, there are no lights and soundtracks and applause for this. It is so, so difficult for many, many parents. But God moves people to adopt children, and uh, that's on the light side of this commandment. Another way that we lead death and destruction is retailing human life, trafficking of children. My niece was in Albania and watched from her window uh, girls being trafficked into the sex trade. Uh, there's slavery on the cocoa plantations of the Congo. <clears throat> there's slavery in the carpet industries in India. There are street children in Brazil that are trafficked into the sex markets. And child sex workers in Bangkok are notorious. There are 65 million girls worldwide who are kept out of school because they're deemed to be less valuable than boys. And you know the stories of the Taliban. They're they're demanding that they be married by the time they're 18 to a Taliban member. Well, this worldview destroys a culture. When we view the cuteness and the vulnerability and the weakness and the innocence of a child as something to be exploited, a commodity to be exploited, we're bringing on death and destruction. And by the way, we do that in our own way. Since I'm making enemies this morning, I'll go ahead and say this one. We do that in, in rich suburban America by making our children, not in, exploiting them not into slavery, but into success. From age of six, we have personal coaches. Um, we have at age 10, overuse weight training injuries. Um, we have girls starting at the age of nine or 10 living thousands of miles from their families so that they can become Olympians. Um, I think of Freddie Adu. Remember him? Freddie Adu was a Ghanaian boy, 14 years old, a soccer phenom. And uh, back in, uh, it was probably 15 years ago now, <clears throat> he made headlines because he was the youngest ever uh, person to turn pro. He went right from wherever he was, eighth grade, into the pros in soccer. And it was a phenomenon. Um, I, I think he's still playing, or, or, but you know, he never made it the way he was supposed to make it. But it was this big deal, kind of like a, a Tiger Woods kind of thing. And, and we, we love to hear this. What is it about us? We, we love to see a Michelle Wee, who's, what, 16 and playing in pro golf. And we, we take this youth, <clears throat> and instead of saying, you know, this kid should be a teenager for a few more years. Let's let them have a, an adolescence. No, we, we plunge them right into our image of success. And by the age of 30, they're nowhere to be found. And they've lost something. So we can do the very same thing on a very different scale. That, that childhood is just the earliest stage of success for, for kids. Okay, I'm getting a lot off my chest this morning, but let's move on. There's other examples of this kind of retailing of human life. Obviously, the pornography industry retails sex. Fetal cell research retails embryos, um, all kinds of things retail human life. We harvest the life of a child for our own self-interest. The fourth way death and destruction comes is by killing human life. And Israel didn't start here, but it ended up there with the idol Molech, where they cast their children literally into the fire to placate the gods and to, gave, to gain for themselves a richer harvest next year. And we believe that this is an early form of infanticide. We believe abortion and euthanasia, infanticide and assisted suicide are the taking of human life. And they fit under this commandment, you shall not murder. What is so clear if we think about outright violence, it becomes obviously clear when we look through the lenses of what's happening at the earliest stages of life. So it would be schizophrenic for us 
to focus on kids in cages or the, the condition of immigrant children or medical care for certain kinds of people and then be indifferent to abortion because that's the literal taking of a life. So in the last 48 years, 62 million children have not been allowed life in this country and tens and tens of millions more around the world. And we need to be reminded of this, that abortion is under the sixth commandment. Now, I'm not going to go to a woman who's had an abortion and call her outright a killer. That would be, that, that would be insensitive, but we need to recognize what it is, okay? We need to recognize what it is. We need to define our terms and make it very clear that that's what it is because if it's not killing, if it doesn't come under the sixth command, then, then it's just a preference or it's just a choice that people get to make. But we, we wanna choose life. We wanna choose what God has said. And, and let's face it, we are all sinners. We've all failed. So we're not condemning persons here uh, into an eternal judgment, what we're saying is we need to stand for life. And, uh, and killing human life is a tragedy in our culture. And if God would stay his hand, it is only because of his mercy. Because we deserve judgment as a country. And we might be receiving it. Well, let's move on to the lighter side. Let's choose life and prosperity. Choosing life and prosperity. Because it says here you have the opportunity to choose, and I love what he says in the preliminary. This sounds like your sounds like your dad or your mom when you didn't want to do a job, right? He says in chapter thirty, verse eleven, for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. <laughs> Neither is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. If you want some, a good place to start or continue your devotionals, just read chapters 29 and 30 of Deuteronomy. It, it's, a, it's a package of a challenge to build this biblical worldview. So let's talk about choosing life and prosperity or life and good. First of all, is to love the Lord your God. It all goes back to the first commandment, to have a renewed mind, to have a refreshed memory, to have a recommitted heart to Him, to, to, to love the Lord your God. That's where it begins. We, we heard that in this wonderful letter I read to you, that, that this woman said, you know, it's, it's my commitment to my Lord whom I've served all these years and his living voice in me that causes me to take this stand. Secondly, walk in his ways, it says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 16. In Ma Micah 6, 8, it says, he has showed you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. And um, that's for us to just protect one life at a time uh, we were having a discussion uh, Wednesday night about last week's message uh, just about the same commandment and and one of the things that we came up with as a, as a just a an action step a takeaway for all of us was when we my wife does this so I'm learning when she is waited on or when somebody checks her out at a, a store she always calls that person by name if they don't have a name tag on, she asks them what their name is. And then she just says, thank you for serving me. That's a, a little pinpoint of dignity, of affirming a life. That person has a name. My dad uh, was with me one time. We were walking into a McDonald's and a guy was asking for food. And, and my dad said, well, I'll, I'll buy you some food, but tell me your name. And he said, tell me your full name. And the guy gave him his full name. And I'll bet that guy hadn't said his full name to anybody for weeks. People have a name. We can look them in the eye. We can make eye contact. Um, we can put our efforts where, where our theology goes. It says to love mercy. All of us have failed morally. 
All of us can never make up for the sin that we have committed, nor can someone who's committed the most horrendous acts against life in this culture. Those who have undergone abortion or those who have encouraged abortion, mercy needs to cover that because God came and found me. He came and found you. So this isn't something just to be preached from a political platform. This isn't just something to win in Congress. It's not just something we argue in the, in the Supreme Court. This is something we need to do with great mercy and understanding and healing as men. I'm so sorry that you were deceived into taking that life and you're suffering now because of your own conscience, but God has a way for you to be healed. We need to act in great mercy with people, to love mercy. And we need to walk humbly, to uh, lay our lives down, lay down our time, lay down our, our resources for things like supporting a crisis pregnancy center or writing or building curriculum or giving medical care or adoption or sometimes picketing, boycotting, political action, legislation, being elected to school boards, uh, teaching science, mentoring kids, you know, giving foster care. There are myriad ways that life can be given and that we can walk humbly by giving of ourselves in the fabric of society where we may never know the outcome and there may never be an applause line for us, but we know that in some small way we've added to the dignity of human life. And then finally, turn away from other gods in verse 17. Turn away from other gods. Uh, there is hardly a friendly voice in our culture about being pro-life. And I like the phrase pro-life um, because it's so broad and it's so positive. But George Barna a few years ago took a survey of evangelical Christians and here's what he found out. 9% of born-again Christians have a biblical worldview. 9%. That does not include, well, it, we, we should up that percentage, right? <laughs> we should be those who say we're, we're building that day by day by day. Well, this is such an important issue. We're gonna talk about it for a couple more weeks, really, because if, if life is not valued, then nothing else will be valued. And uh, we need to be men who understand that from a biblical perspective. And we never know in our, our networks, our work, our families, our extended families and our neighborhoods, when we'll have an opportunity to speak a word or do an action that is choosing life uh, for ourselves and for somebody else. So you have some questions and some discussion around your table. Uh, who knows where this will go? but I know God will lead you. So let's talk amongst ourselves.